know, up here. I'm in Iceland, and Iceland has a lot of moss. I mean, a lot, a lot of moss. But one thing Iceland doesn't have a lot of is trees. So what happens when you add trees to a land of moss? That's the question I'm trying to figure out. So come along with me on this journey, and let's see if we can find an answer. This is an Icelandic forest. Now you might be thinking to yourself, wait, I thought Iceland didn't have any trees. And that is predominantly true. See, most of Iceland looks like this. No trees, as far as the eye can see. But this wasn't always the case. Before the first settlers arrived in Iceland, it was actually estimated that 25 to 40% of all of the island was covered with trees. But when the first people showed up on the shore, they needed lumber for houses wood for boats, wood for fuel. And so they started cutting down the trees. And because of Iceland's really harsh climate, it's, it's cold weather, it's fast winds, it's poor soil, and also the fact that there's free grazing sheep, which love to eat tiny saplings, the trees never grew back. So it was estimated that at peak deforestation, only 1% of the island was left having trees. So that brings us back to this. In the early 1900s, a few folks started thinking, hey, maybe it would be nice if we didn't have to import all of our lumber, or maybe it would be nice if we had a few wind blocks growing around our community. And so a few eccentrics at the time put up some fences to keep the sheep out and threw a few saplings in the ground. Now this process of replanting and afforestation has grown and grown and grown until now almost 5 million saplings are planted a year. And so that gives us places like this little plots of forest scattered across the once barren Icelandic landscape. Now actually one of the main catalysts for such an increased amount of tree planting in Iceland is climate change. See, trees are great carbon sinks, meaning they take CO2 out of the atmosphere and store it within their bodies. Now the Icelandic government has actually claimed that by 2040, all of Iceland will be carbon neutral. Now that's a lofty goal, but if they're to actually get there, trees are gonna play a super critical role in achieving this. So trees can work as carbon offsets. So let's say that Iceland emits 400 tons of CO2 every year. If they plant enough trees that the trees can suck out of the atmosphere 400 tons of CO2, then they cancel each other out and that achieves carbon neutrality. So while Iceland still might be emitting CO2, if there's enough trees that sucks all that emitted CO2 out and stores it, that's net zero. Hey, wait a minute. You said this video is about moss, and now all you're talking about is trees. I know, I know, I know. This is about moss, as I promised. There's just a little bit of background information that I have to give you now so that everything makes sense in the end. In a few moments, I'll show you some juicy moss footage, and you can go on about your day and leave it at that. But just give me a few more seconds. So there's really two main factors that are the drivers for planting trees in Iceland. One is carbon sequestration, and two is building up the lumber industry. And because those are the main focuses, that's also what a lot of the forest research is focused on as well. You get topics of like, which trees grow best in Iceland? Which ones have the highest yield or are the most efficient? How does planting a forest affect carbon cycling? Which trees store the most carbon, et cetera, and so on. But trees and forests are actually really critical ecosystems, and not to mention an ecosystem that has been largely absent from Iceland for the last couple hundred years. So there's actually a really big gap in the research on how forests affect flora and fauna, and generally the ecological community. And while there's been some research here, there's a lot that is lacking. 
So that finally brings me to mosses. See, I told you we'd get here soon. Now, I really like moss, and as I said at the beginning, there's a lot of moss here in Iceland. So I wanted to look at how does moss diversity change within different types of forests? Essentially trying to fill just a little bit of this research gap on how planting more and more trees in Iceland actually affects the ecological community. So there's actually only four trees that are native to Iceland, and only one of them, this one here, the downy birch, actually forms forests. So before the settlers came and wiped out all the trees, these are the types of forests that would have made up all of Iceland. Now the only problem with downy birch is they don't have a lot of great characteristics for human industry. As you can see, they're kind of small and crooked and twisted. And that doesn't make them very good for lumber. Also, they're pretty slow growing, which doesn't make them very good for sequestering a lot of carbon by 2040. So as trees are being planted here in Iceland, most of the trees being planted are actually exotic species. Species like the Siberian larch, the Sitka spruce, the lodgepole pine, the black cottonwood. And while these are planted because they grow straight, and they grow tall, and they grow fast, which are great for industry and carbon sequestration, none of these have ever lived in Iceland before. And three of those species are actually conifers, which are very different than the deciduous downy birch. So how does these different forest types that have not been in Iceland before affect the mosses that are living on the ground? Are there more mosses that live in one forest type over another? Is there higher amounts of mosses that grow in one forest type over another? Is there only a certain type of moss that grows in the Sitka spruce, but not in the lodgepole pine? Come along with me as I try to find the answer to that question. How does moss diversity and abundance change in Icelandic forest types? So I've chosen to look at three different Icelandic forest types. A downy birch forest, a lodgepole pine forest, and a Sitka spruce forest. Now, each of these forest types have pretty different characteristics. So the Sitka spruce has a really dense canopy cover, lodgepole pine kind of intermediary, and then the downy birch, pretty light, a lot of light coming in. And because of that, the ground floors in these different forests look really different. So what I would assume is that the moss diversity and the moss species within these different forest types are also very different. So I'm looking at these forest types in two locations in the south of Iceland. One location is Gerageti and one is Selfoss. Now why these locations? Well, I'm living in Selfoss and they both have really good forests. And also why the south of Iceland? Well, it's already the middle of November. So winter's coming and I really want to get all my data collected through the snowfalls, so I moved south. So in each location, I'm sampling two of each forest type. So in Gretagethi, I have two birch plots. In Selfoss, I have two birch plots. In I have two Sitka spruce plots. In Selfoss, I have two spruce plots. And so on with the lodgepole pine. So in total, this gives me four replicates of each of the three forest types. At each forest plot, I'm looking at 10 quadrats. In each quadrat, I'm looking at the total amount of moss coverage, as well as the number of species present. So that gives me two locations, six forest plots per location, and 10 quadrats per forest plot. So in total, that's 120 quadrats to sample. And that's a lot of moss identification. So we should probably get started. Let's do it. So 120 quadrats later, I am done in the field. We're gonna wrap things up here and head inside to ID and do some data analysis.
So I finished my IDing, I'd done my statistical tests, and here's what I found. It's actually two very straightforward things. One, the total percent cover of mosses in the three forest types did not change. So in the Sitka spruce, the lodgepole pine, the downy birch, there was no difference in the amount of moss that was on the ground floor. However, the second thing, and more importantly, is that there was higher diversity in the conifer forests when compared to the birch forests. Now, why does this actually matter? To answer this, we have to look at some research that's been done on similar topics. Studies have shown that total ground vegetation diversity and specifically vascular plant diversity increases with light. Now vascular plants are anything that's not a moss or a lichen. And because we looked at forests with three different canopy densities, there was three forests with different amounts of light. Therefore, we would assume that in the spruce forests, which are darker, and the birch forests, which are lighter, the spruce would have the lowest vascular plant diversity and the birch would have the highest vascular plant diversity. Now, if you were paying attention to the results, you'd notice I found something very different. In fact, I found the opposite of this. Moss diversity was highest in conifer forests and lowest in the downy birch forest. Now, how do we take these two pieces of contrasting information and put them together? To figure that out, we have to go back to our original conversation about planting trees. Because of Iceland's emphasis on afforestation, it's important to understand how to plant trees that promote biodiversity rather than limit it. While a lot of studies in the past have suggested that this is best done with a mixed forest model, which is the combination of deciduous and conifer trees mixed into one big forest plot, I'm going to suggest that our results actually show that a different design is better. I propose that forests made up of many monoculture plots might actually be the best way of promoting biodiversity over the landscape scale. So instead of having birch and conifer trees mixed together in one homogeneous mixed forest, we would instead have individual pure stands of just conifers or just birch and those mixed across the forest. So let me explain this just a little bit further. We found that moss diversity was highest in the conifer forests, therefore suggesting that certain species of moss only exist in the conifer forests and not in the downy birch. However, we also said earlier that some studies show that vascular plant diversity may actually be higher in the downy birch forests. Therefore, if we plant just conifer trees, we'll have the most moss species. And if we plant just downy birch trees, we'll have the most vascular plant species. If we create a mixed forest, we'll have some of those species that like the downy birch and some of those species that like the conifers, but not all of them. However, with forests made up of monoculture plots, we have all the species that can live in the conifers, all of those mosses, as well as all of the vascular plants that live just in the downy birch therefore creating the maximum amount of vegetation diversity over the entire forest. Now it is important to note that this is just a hypothesis. Now more research needs to be done on mixed forests versus forests made up of monoculture plots, and my study as a whole just needs to be bigger. We need to sample more quadrats, more forests, more locations, and it would be nice to look at what are the environmental factors that are really driving the differences in diversity between the forest types. But all of that being said, it's pretty cool to think that this, this tiny little moss, may affect the future of how we plant forests in Iceland. So thanks for sticking around all the way to this point. I hope that maybe you learned one or two things throughout this process and maybe are even inspired to go out, pick up a quadrat, and see what you can learn about the world around you. Until next time.